Okay, uh, thank you all for your attendance. Uh, my name is Peter. I'm part of the research and development team uh, at Oz Diagnostics, uh, and we're an Australian based developer and manufacturer of uh, IVD diagnostic devices. And today I want to present uh, an overview of one of our key technologies, uh, the Oz Diagnostics Multiplex uh, Tandem PCR method. Um, I'd also highlight a few real world uh, applications of multiplex tandem PCR or MTPCR as we like to call it um, as a molecular diagnostic method. So in this presentation, uh, I would like to cover the basic principle uh, of the MTPCR method. Uh, I'll provide a few uh, practical examples uh, of its application, uh, specifically looking uh, at its application as a syndromic testing method. Uh, and I'll, then we'll also look at a few other real world applications uh, of MTPCR, including uh, SNP typing uh, to insert, infer the, the presence of a SARS CoV 2 uh, variant of concern. And then we'll have a look at uh, MTPCR for the identification of common uh, STIs, uh, including resistance markers for uh, ceftriaxone, fluoroquinolone, and macrolide based uh, antibiotics. Uh, then I'd also like to share one final example um, of MTPCR um, applied uh, in diagnostic mycology, um, more as a time saver than anything else. So just starting with the whole concept uh, of syndromic testing, uh, the main idea of syndromic testing is, is really just to remove some of the, the uncertainty that might be present uh, within a clinical diagnosis. Uh, so, for example, if a, if a patient presents to a, a clinician with a set of uh, fairly non-specific uh, symptoms, say something like a, a headache, cough, or a fever, or something along those lines, um, a clinician could probably make a presumptive diagnosis that their patient um, probably has a respiratory virus of some sort. But the question, of course, is which respiratory virus? You know, it could be the something that's usually mild, like rhinovirus, uh, something a little bit more serious, like uh, influenza, or it could be something that's currently a public health risk, like SARS-CoV-2, or something else entirely. We, you know, we really don't know until we test for it. Now, in the current uh, pandemic in, uh, environment we find ourselves in, uh, distinguishing the actual cause of agent in such cases is, is really now more critical than ever. Uh, not just for the patient and for patient management, but for the, the safety of the community as a whole. And this is where syndromic testing uh, really makes sense. Uh, the advantage, of course, uh, for the clinician is that they don't actually need to uh, specify every pathogen uh, that they suspect on their pathology request form um, and potentially risk uh, missing the causative agent. They could simply order something like a respiratory PCR or a, spirit, a respiratory screen um, and know that they're covered for the majority of cases out there. So once the results come back um, and the causative agent has been identified, um, hopefully this can provide the basis for a more uh, precise diagnosis, um, which hopefully should lead to better clinical management and better clinical outcomes. Well, the ability to test um, a patient for a broad collection of pathogens, uh, you know, is a great tool for the clinician. Uh, it can really pose some logistical challenges uh, for those of us in the lab actually performing the tests. You know, for this kind of thing to be to be practical um, and cost effective, uh, such testing really needs to be applied in a in a large kind of multiplex format, uh, preferably one large multiplex uh, with as little hands-on time as possible. And this is where MTPCR um, really fits in and where MTPCR really stands out. So for those that aren't uh, familiar with the technique, uh, MTPCR is a, is a highly multiplexed um, diagnostic method uh, developed by um, Oz Diagnostics, uh, which allows labs to simultaneously test for, for multiple pathogens uh, from a single starting sample. So this slide gives the a basic overview of the MTPCR process. Uh, so as you can see, it's a, it's a two-step process with two separate uh, amplification reactions. Now, step one is where uh, reverse transcription occurs um, and what we call uh, sample enrichment. Uh, step two is then uh, another amplification step 
um, followed by detection. So let's have a look at uh, each one of these steps in a little bit more detail. So starting with step one, uh, in step one, the first thing that happens is that the sample is added to the reaction tube um, along with the master mix. Um, the first uh, step that would occur is a reverse transcription uh, is performed. The sample is then enriched in a, in a highly multiplexed uh, limited cycle reaction uh, containing a collection of primers for, for all the pathogens, all the pathogens of interest. Now, depending on the application, this can be anywhere from eight uh, to over 30 assays um, in a single reaction. Now, the low number of cycles uh, used in a step one reaction, uh, this is normally around 15, uh, really does minimize the formation of any non-specific product as um, off-target reactions don't really have enough uh, cycles or, or time to become established. Now, the main benefit of doing it this way is that only a single 10 microliter sample uh, is actually needed, uh, even when um, assaying over 30 targets. So upon completion of step one, um, if any of the pathogens were present uh, that we're assaying for, uh, the amount of those uh, pathogens now present in that sample is greatly enriched. Of course, uh, the majority of this process is actually uh, quite automated, uh, where the user just needing to place their, their plate or tubes of extracts, uh, along with the consumables on the processor and you know, hit the start button. So currently we have uh, two robotic platforms for this. Uh, the top image there is our uh, high plates instrument, uh, which can perform up to 24 MT-PCR reactions uh, at a time. And the lower image is our ultraplex instrument, uh, which can process up to 96 uh, MT-PCR reactions at a time. So that's uh, step one in a nutshell. Let's move on to uh, step two. Okay. So in the step two reaction, uh, the product of the step one reaction actually becomes the sample. So the first thing that happens is the step one product is diluted. Uh, this provides us uh, a clean basis or a clean sample uh, that's made up predominantly of targets that were identified uh, in the step one reaction. Uh, this is then split into multiple singleplex uh, or duplex reactions across a three to four wall plate. As the primers used in step two um, are actually positioned within the product um, of the step one reaction, um, this really gives MTPCR a greatly improved specificity as effectively um, two separate PCR reactions are needed uh, for successful detection. Okay. So step two then proceeds uh, as you'd expect as a, a standard real-time reaction uh, with the analysis of each step two reaction uh, performed through a combination of CQ uh, and also null curve analysis with integrated software providing a call uh, for each step to reaction. So what is the benefit of this technique? Uh, MT-PCR has a number of advantages uh, when applied to in vitro diagnostics. Uh, firstly, and probably most importantly, uh, the capability to perform um, a very large multiplex reaction uh, from a single sample uh, really does lend the technique very well to comprehensive uh, syndromic testing. MTPCR is also quite specific. Um, you now, as two separate assays are needed uh, for successful detection. Uh, the technique is also very sensitive, um, only needing around 10 copies of reaction uh, or less in, in most cases. And in practical use, uh, MTPCR also needs minimal hands on time as. Our uh, setup is performed by an accompanying uh, robotic platform that we uh, showed earlier. Um, and MTPCR is also quite flexible uh, when it comes to throughput. Uh, we currently offer MTPCR that can range anywhere uh, between 1 to 96 samples uh, per run. And it's also capable of being applied to some more specialised PCR applications, such as the detection of uh, SNPs, or insertions, or deletions. So now we've covered the basic principle, uh, I want to share with you some real world examples. So this first case uh, is taken from our respiratory pathogens uh, 24 well panel, 
which detects 28 different respiratory pathogens uh, and also has two uh, integrated internal controls. And this is what the output uh, would typically look like. So just so this makes sense, uh, this is looking at um, the results of a single sample within the ROM. Uh, the list on the left uh, displays all the pathogens that were tested uh, and if anything was detected. So from the top, we have uh, influenza A and B, uh, no sisters, uh, two different assays for SARS-CoV-2, of course, uh, chlamydophilia cytosai, RSV, and so on as we continue down the list. The cycling curves and melt curves are displayed there on the right, uh, the top graph being uh, the cycling curve, uh, which displays the fluorescence on the y-axis uh, versus the cycle number on the x-axis, with the lower graph uh, being the melt curve, uh, which displays the change in fluorescence on the y-axis uh, with respect to the temperature um, on the x. So looking at the results now, uh, we have a positive here for parainfluenza 1 virus, uh, which is the orange curve. Uh, we also have two positives that are internal controls. Uh, the black curve there is the inhibitor control. Uh, so as the name suggests, uh, this informs the user if the reaction uh, has proceeded normally um, or if it's been inhibited in some way. It does this by having a defined CQ range in which it should be positive. So if it falls outside this range, this is an indication uh, of inhibition within, within the reaction. And obviously this is going to be flagged to the user uh, and may also warrant um, a re-extraction or repeat uh, of the testing. Now the purple curve there is our sample adequacy control. So this control uh, looks for the presence of human DNA within the sample. Uh, and what this does is it, is it informs the user um, really of the quality of the sample collection. So if we think about it, if, the, if there is no human DNA present within the sample, uh, this indicates to the user that the sample uh, collection, uh, this is a swab we're normally talking about, uh, was probably not performed correctly. Um, so this might warrant uh, a recollection request from the lab. Uh, in this particular case though, it looks like the collector was uh, exceedingly thorough. And yes, if you're wondering, uh, all pathogens can be detected simultaneously from a single sample um, at the same time without, without any issues. Okay, so in addition to syndromic testing, uh, the next application I'd like to present is MT-PCR used for SNP discrimination. So this is a case uh, taken from our SARS-CoV-2 typing panel. Uh, now, this panel identifies the presence of SARS-CoV-2 uh, along with six point mutations and one deletion uh, in the surface glycoprotein associated with uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, variants of concern. Now, specifically, it's looking for the presence of uh, N5I1Y, uh, K417N and T, E484K and Q, and P681R uh, mutations. Uh, along with the HV6970 deletion. Now, all of these are mutations that are associated with uh, SARS-CoV-2 variants of concern. So in one aspect, the SNP pattern can be used to uh, either alert to the presence of the variant of concern, uh, but it can also be used to infer the variant present. So similar to the, uh, the previous example, this, um, this panel also has two internal controls. Uh, included. One is the, an inhibitor control and another is a human RNA control, which plays a, a dual function. Uh, one aspect is a sample adequacy control and as a second function as a reverse transcription uh, control. So this is what uh, an output would typically look like. Again, this is looking at the results uh, from a single sample out of the run. Uh, like the prior example, the list on the left displays uh, the variables this panel is testing for, uh, which in this particular panel can really be grouped into uh, three separate sections. So we have a section for SARS-CoV-2 detection and confirmation, uh, a section of assays for SNP typing, and then a, a section of assays for controls. So as in the prior example, uh, the cycling curves and melt curves are displayed on the right. Uh, unlike the prior example, however, uh, there's a window in the bottom left 
that provides a more direct interpretation uh, of the results to the user. So if we have a look at that box now, uh, that's the box in the, the bottom left of these results. It informs us that uh, SARS-CoV-2 is present, uh, confirmed by three separate assays, uh, targeting ORC1, ORC6, and ORC8. So that's our SARS confirmation. Uh, we also have N501Y uh, detected, and the HV6970 deletion uh, is also present. Um, all other positions here uh, examined are reporting as wild type, uh, except the amino acid position 681, which here is reporting as other. So it's not the wild type, it's not P681R, which informs it's, it's, a, it's another known mutation of this position, uh, namely P681H uh, is likely present. So in this case, uh, we can then use the SNP pattern uh, to infer the variant present. So as you probably guessed from the title of the slide, uh, this SNP pattern is fairly indicative um, of the alpha variant. So we'll be able to infer with a good deal of confidence that uh, the sample we have is an alpha variant. So how do we actually infer uh, the variant present from the SNP pattern? The way we do it is we can actually uh, apply the obtained pattern of mutations uh, to a matrix of known SNPs uh, in each variant to derive the variant present. So this table is a little bit busy, uh, but I'll try to break it down for you. So uh, each row here is a variant. Uh, the first three columns identify uh, the variant lineage. Uh, the WHO's uh, media friendly label for that lineage. Uh, and also if this uh, lineage is considered a variant of concern or a variant of interest uh, currently as specified by the WHO. The following five columns, uh, columns then display the known genotype of each variant uh, at each in amino acid position assessed. Uh, it's then really just a matter of matching the obtained SNP pattern uh, to infer the variant detected. So uh, just taking the example that we gave uh, in the previous slide, so we had uh, N501Y detected, uh, we also had HV6970 uh, deletion detected, and we've also inferred that uh, P681H uh, is also present. So if we have a look uh, column by column, we can see N501Y is present in the alpha, beta, gamma, theta, and mu variants. Um, if we then have a look at HV6970, uh, this is present in the uh, alpha variant, um, and it's also present in the eta variant. However, only the alpha variant has N5RMY and HV6970 um, together. We can then keep looking through uh, the SNP pattern uh, and make sure the rest of uh, what's being reported matches. So here we also have alpha, a wild type of position 417, a wild type of position 484, and P681 is reporting as P681H. So the SNP profile that we've generated matches the SNP profile that you'd expect to see in an alpha variant. So again, we can then infer with a good deal of confidence that the sample that we have is an alpha variant. So just one more example of this, just to kind of reinforce the point. Uh, in this sample, we've got uh, SARS-CoV-2 again as present, uh, again confirmed by three separate assays targeting ORF1, 6 and 8. So for this, I'm just looking in the little uh, diagnostic box uh, in the bottom left corner. <clears throat> now, all positions examined in the sample are wild type, uh, except amino acid position 601. Uh, which is reporting as P681R. And once again, as you've probably already derived from the title, uh, this SNP pattern is fairly indicative of the Delta variant. But don't take my word for it, we should uh, check against the matrix to be sure. So once again, we can have a look through, and the only variant uh, that we have here that matches uh, wild type at 501, 6970, 417, and 484, and also has a P681R mutation, uh, is indeed the Delta variant. So once again, from the table, we can infer with a good deal of confidence uh, that the sample we have uh, is in fact a Delta variant. Now, of course, um, due to the rapidly evolving uh, pandemic situation we find ourselves in, uh, this panel and this, ma this matrix in particular 
Uh, it's something that's going to be continuously updated uh, as new variants emerge uh, and new data becomes available. Okay, so let's shift to something uh, a little bit different. Uh, this next case is taken from our urine, genital and resistance panel. So this panel detects um, common STI pathogens such as uh, chlamydia, gonorrhea and mycoplasma. And it also informs of cefriaxone resistance in uh, Mysteria gonorrhea and fluoroquinolone and macrolide resistance in uh, mycoplasma genitalium. So once again, this is looking at the results from um, a single sample uh, taken from the run. So similar to the previous examples, the lift on the left um, displays the variables the panel is testing, uh, with the cyclone curves and melt curves displayed on the right. Uh, like the SARS typing example, uh, there's also a window in the bottom left that provides an interpretation of the results for the user. So uh, in this uh, particular case, we have a positive for gonorrhea, which is the green curve. Uh, and if you're wondering why there are actually two melt or two green melt per, uh, peaks, it's because gonorrhea is actually confirmed by uh, two separate assays here, uh, one targeting uh, open J and one targeting open H, I believe. Uh, both of which are in the same well, so uh, just for confirmation. So the blue curve here is for uh, ceftriaxone resistance. Uh, and we also have two positives uh, that are the internal controls. So once again, the, the black curve is the inhibitor control, uh, with the purple curve being our sample adequacy control. Now, as I, as I already mentioned, there's a window in the bottom left that provides an interpretation of the results. So in this case, it tells us that we have a patient that is positive for gonorrhea. And more importantly, uh, it is also identified as ceftriaxone resistance. Now this is all uh, vital information that when provided to a clinician can really help guide an appropriate treatment uh, for this particular patient. Now there's just one final example um, I'd like to share with you. Now this case is taken from our uh, Dematophytes 12 well panel. Now, so for those that might not be familiar, um, Dematophytes cover a, a broad set of fungal species uh, responsible for uh, infections of the skin, uh, hair and nails uh, mainly, um, more commonly referred to uh, as tinea or sometimes ringworm. So you can have uh, you know, tinea cactus, which is uh, the infection of the scalp, uh, tinea corpus on the body, and so on and so forth. Now, while I'd expect the majority of clinicians out there uh, to be able to diagnose such infections um, really without the need for pathology, um, a lot of the times samples are still going to be sent to the lab uh, just for confirmation. Now, this is actually a requirement um, from the PBS if um, treatment with tibinafine is actually intended. So from a lab perspective, um, these are really not that difficult to process, but the one thing that can be is very, very time consuming. So a typical protocol uh, would usually involve uh, something like microscopy for uh, initial verification, uh, followed by a culture to confirm the species present. So a turnaround time for this kind of result uh, is not normally that uh, rapid. Um, the main reason is dematophyte culture typically, typically will take about three weeks to complete. Um, now, as you can imagine, three-week culture time, you're going to need um, a lot of staff time uh, to manage the cultures, um, and as these obviously have to get checked uh, on a regular basis for growth, and then uh, proper typing uh, performed once growth has been established. Now, this is can be a bit of an issue, especially when the modified confirmation requests can be quite a common task uh, for the mycology lab. So, you know, it's not unheard of for labs to have uh, thousands of these uh, requested a year or more in some cases, uh, which they have to process. So this is where MTPCR can be applied, um, really is a real time saver uh, in this kind of situation. So it's something that uh, once took three weeks to report, uh, can now you know, be reported the same day. So having a look at uh, an example run. So once again, this is uh, the results uh, looking from a single sample, looking at a single sample uh, in the result, in the, the run file. 
Uh, similar to the previous examples on the list, uh, the list on the left displays the variable uh, the panel is testing for. So from the top, we have uh, Trichophyton species, uh, then the Trichophyton rubrum complex, uh, the Metaprophytes complex, uh, Microsporum species, and then uh, Microsporum canis, and so on, you know, as we go down the list. Uh, once again, we've got the, the cyclone curves and melt curves uh, displayed on the right. So looking at the results, uh, once again, the black curve is our inhibitor control. Uh, in this particular panel, uh, there's actually no sample ad adequacy control, as it's not really required with the, the intended uh, sample types that we have. So as you can as you can imagine, you can typically see uh, if nail clippings or skin scrapings or hair is being successfully collected. So uh, coming back to this run again, uh, in this case, we have a positive reported for trichophyton species. So uh, genus level uh, identification, which is the red curve. Um, we also have a positive reported for uh, the trichophyton rubrum complex, uh, which is the green curve. So this can then be reported to the clinician as confirmation of their initial diagnosis of dematophyte infection with the causative agent identified as trichophyton rubrum, um, all around three weeks earlier than they normally expect. So overall, uh, I hope I've shown that MTPCR is, a, is an effective platform for comprehensive uh, syndromic testing. Um, I hope I've also demonstrated that MTPCR can also be applied to a wide range of diagnostic applications from uh, respiratory pathogens, uh, STIs, uh, and mycology, as, as demonstrated. Uh, but it can also be applied to uh, enteric pathogens, uh, CSF screening, uh, genetic screening, uh, which these are all things I didn't actually have uh, time to present today, but they, they are other applications of MTPCR. And, and I hope I've shown that MTPCR can be quite flexible um, in things such as uh, SNP typing, uh, the identification of insertions, deletions, and so forth, uh, and is also capable of providing uh, useful additional feedback to the connection on things such as uh, the resistance status uh, of a particular pathogen. So hopefully you found this uh, presentation informative and come away with a, a better understanding uh, of the MT-PCR method and obviously a few of its advantages. So just before I finish up, uh, I'd like to thank uh, the NRL for putting on this conference, uh, given the, the trying uh, circumstances we find ourselves in, uh, and allowing us to provide this talk uh, to you today. So thank you all for your attendance. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this, uh, this brief presentation and I'll pass you back to our moderator. Thank you.